That economic restart could not come soon enough for some people, though. The latest employment data from just yesterday showed another 2 million Canadians lost their job in the month of April. That means that now 3 million Canadians are out, at wor out of work, and the unemployment rate now stands at 13 percent. Justin Trudeau announced uh, earlier this week, yesterday in fact, that it is uh, that he will extend, his government will extend the wage subsidy package uh, for businesses to try and hire back some of those workers that will be extended now beyond uh, June. We are expecting to hear the details of that uh, next week and perhaps some more details from the Prime Minister today. Let me bring in my uh, colleague, Catherine Cullen, who's here to help with our coverage here in Ottawa. Um, Catherine, I don't think we're expecting anything new from the Prime Minister today, but if you think back through the week in terms of things that have happened, uh, the wage subsidy extension is probably mm -hmm. the, biggest, uh, th the biggest move by the government and a recognition that more help was definitely needed to try and get businesses ready to bring their workers back as we see parts of the economy reopening. That's right, and the announcement coinciding, Rosemary, with those, uh, obviously, I mean, what, what is the word? Devastating, very troubling job numbers that we saw yesterday. You talk about those top line figures, three million people who have lost their jobs um, since the beginning of the outbreak, since February, but we know that there are a great number meant millions more workers, in fact, who have been affected by this, who have seen a reduction in their hours, who are working from home, uh, changes, all manner of changes. now. As for how long that wage subsidy extension is going to be, the Prime Minister did say yesterday that it's something they were going to talk about le next week. Uh, Carla Qualtro, though, Employment Minister, on and with our colleague Bashi Capellos last night, did say that she expects that it's going to be more than a month, but that this is something that they are certainly still working on. She also said when it comes to uh, the emergency response benefit, the CERB, that they're also looking at an extension of that as well, that it's something they are thinking about very seriously. In the case of that particular benefit, extending it is something that would require legislative changes. They'd have to go back to the House of Commons. We've seen that that process can be a bit touch and go, although the parties have uh, repeatedly arrived at an agreement on getting these badly needed benefits through. But long story short, we're certainly expecting to see mm -hmm. various kinds of extensions of these benefits. The government does, I think, prefer to have people on the wage subsidy. Not only might they be getting a bit more money because of the way the wage subsidy works, but they wouldn't be considered, Carla Qualtro said, uh, unemployed because they're attached yeah. to their employer. So the numbers would certainly look a bit better. Of course, none of it, though, an ideal situation. Yeah, and those numbers, uh, that, that wage subsidy was supposed to start rolling out this week. Uh, Thursday, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I've heard of any businesses that have already tapped into it. Uh, or we have, haven't heard anecdotes totally whether uh, everything has started rolling out. We do know that 120,000 businesses applied, that the government expects that covers 1.7 million Canadians. So you, you can see how uh, as more businesses apply, tap into it, that should help uh, some of the people, uh, some Canadians get off CERB because that's a very high number too, more than 7 million. I think the question is with the pace of reopening different in across the country, um, you know, th that number will take some time to increase as businesses decide what they can do and how they can reopen safely for their employees too. Well, and this was part of the reason, I think, part of the logic for extending the wage subsidy. We heard from the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses yesterday praising this decision, noting that some businesses were thinking, well, listen, this is supposed to uh, wind up uh, in June. I don't know if my business is going to be reopened, so we're certainly going to need more help. Um, the question is how much, which leads into this question of how long is all of this going to go on? What is a recovery effort going to look like? And of course, how long is all of this going to go on? Uh, n nobody really knows no, that, but it's no. interesting to see how the government is trying to plan for this. And we heard the Prime Minister say yesterday, when it comes to a variety of these measures, it's, it is going to be about constantly adjusting as we get a better sense of the uh, overall picture. Yeah, and I had actually forgotten until I reread the, the, the notes that my producer Phil uh, prepares for me that the wage subsidy is actually retroactive to March mm -hmm. 15th. So the sooner companies can start getting it, the sooner they can get back all that money from before as well, because of course expenses for, for companies haven't uh, really stopped, regardless of the size of the company. So that money might be uh, pretty critical to businesses as well. If I just look back through the things that have happened through the course of the week though, uh, which we will expect the Prime Minister to highlight 
highlight too. There's been the aid for the agriculture and food industry. There's been the really important agreement between provinces and Ottawa to somehow top up essential workers' pay, and, and, and then this extension of the wage subsidy. So in terms of the policy work to support Canadians through this pandemic, it, it doesn't really seem to be slowing down. Uh, in fact, it is, as you say, just trying to bridge the gaps and the holes that might be out there still for some Canadians and some industries. And we know that there are a couple of holes that still need to be addressed. The Prime Minister himself saying that there is something coming for seniors, um, you know, many of them on fixed income, they haven't seen their, impl uh, their, their, their income necessarily changed by this if they are on, for instance, a pension, but they may have seen their costs go up. Just one of the many concerns that Canadian seniors can be facing right now, uh, whether it's increased cost of groceries, increased cost to get your groceries delivered uh, on top of some of the challenges that they're dealing with, being particularly vulnerable, facing isolation. The Prime Minister has said something is coming. I know we've talked on this program that mm -hmm. we wondered whether it would be yesterday or today. No, it looks like it's going to be next week. We're still looking at what form it might take, too. We know in some instances the government has looked at things like increasing the uh, GST credit for low-income Canadians to try to get a bit more money to people on top of things like the emergency response benefit. So would it be some sort of measure like that, increasing an existing benefit to get it directly to seniors? Uh, that's certainly one option. Okay, Catherine, uh, I'll come back to you if you don't mind. We can see there the Prime Minister's front door. He will emerge in about 10 minutes' time or so to give us a briefing, uh, an update on how his government's responding to the pandemic. Uh, for now, though, I, I want to talk about another issue that I know so many of you are also considering, Canadians who are lucky enough to have a cottage uh, and thinking about when can I get up there uh, to try and test it out or, as Premier Ford did the other day, just to make sure everything is okay. Uh, in Ontario, though, some officials are asking seasonal residents to just hold off for a while. Joining me now is Graydon Smith, and he's the mayor of Bracebridge, Ontario. It's part of the beautiful Muskoka Cottage country in, in this province, and that's where we've reached him. Mayor Smith, good to see you, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning. So what are you uh, advising to people? Because obviously, uh, you know, people are feeling like they'd like to get away, they'd like to, to, to get out of their houses, and if they have a cottage, they think to themselves, well, that'll be safe, I'll just head up there and I'll, I'll just self-isolate at my cottage for a little while. And that's understandable, and this has gone on for quite some time now, obviously, and from the beginning, we've seen people that have uh, cottages or seasonal homes here because we get snowbirds returning uh, to their only home in Canada in this area, um, coming to this area and, and you know, taking refuge. And despite the fact that there's been a lot of discussion about what people can and can't do, there's really been nothing prohibiting people doing that. But we have been asking um, secondary homeowners to hold off. Uh, at the beginning, there was concerns about food supply and certainly the uh, ability for our hospitals to deal with any large numbers of patients because they're relatively small. Sure. Uh, I think as time has gone on, that's changed a little bit, and, and we're softening that language uh, to some degree. So uh, is it okay then for people to be going back and forth from the city to their cottage? Do you want them, are you saying you can move up here and do your self-isolation permanently? What is, what is the best case scenario for you? So again, there are people that are already here. And for those people, I think it's preferential that they stay here. If somebody's coming to the area, I think they should try and stay here as well. What we really don't want to see are people that are constantly moving from community to community because, of course, that's going to exacerbate the potential for community spread. I guess the other concern, and it is a real one, of course, uh, during all this, is the economic impact. Because if you have people who usually would start coming up probably May long weekend in a couple of weeks and come up systematically every weekend and then for an extended period in the summer, that's bound to have an economic fallout for your community. Absolutely. Our economy, especially in the summertime, is supported by our seasonal and uh, tourism uh, visitors. And so it's going to be a very difficult 2020, regardless of what things look like. Right now, we're t only talking about seasonal and cottage property owners coming up. We're not talking about the tourism industry reopening in any way. In fact, yeah. we'd say if people want to come on a day trip, they, they really shouldn't be doing that because there's no infrastructure here to support them. There's no open restaurants. There's mm -hmm. no public parks, per se. There's no you know, washrooms for you to use. So, uh, you know, this is a kind of a, an opening to a very small segment, an offering to a small segment uh, of the population to, to come and check on your cottage or stay at your cottage. Uh, but understand that if you are doing it, 
we're expecting you to follow all the protocols that have been put in place to keep everybody safe. And I know uh, the premier got a little flack the other day because he had told people not to go to cottages over the Easter long weekend. Then he decided to go up and check on his pipes and people criticized him for making that decision. But ha have you seen people doing that? Because, I mean, it is a second residence. There there's certainly uh, nice, very nice cottages in your neck of the woods. So are people coming up just to make sure uh, p things are OK? And have you been discouraging that up to this point? Well, we've been trying to promote public health advice and public health right. advice at this point, whether it's been from Dr. Tam or Dr. Williams in Ontario or our local medical officer of health has been to uh, limit non-essential travel, which to us has meant, please don't uh, come right now. But we know people have done that. Uh, some people have come up and stayed. Some people have made that day trip just to check on things. And other people have contacted me to say, you know what, we're going to ride this out. We understand what you're asking, and we're just going to hang in the city for a while, and, and we'll get there when everything is a little bit better. And la last question around supplies. You said initially you were a bit worried about food supplies and you know other things that people might need. Uh, would that be okay now if people went up or are you telling them to bring their supplies? What's your best advice on that front? Ideally bring your own supplies with you because we're uh, in a situation where we've got a limited number of stores and the lineups can get pretty long uh, on a good day, especially yeah. uh, on the weekend. So sure. if people can bring their own supplies, uh, self-isolate as best they can, try and limit their interactions with people while they're here, uh, I think that's uh, you know a, a good saw off for everybody in this. Um, it's been interesting. I've received uh, some, some not so nice emails from people um, mad that we're telling them they, they can't come. And no, we didn't say you can't come. We said you shouldn't come. Uh, but if you do come, here's what you should do. And that's really where we're at today. We see this as a, a very slow opening of a door trying to get through it. Uh, it's going to take quite some time. It's not going to be a linear progression back to normal. Uh, but we want to work with uh, all citizens of Muskoka and all property owners and seasonal residents and people that love this area to, to work together, um, be compassionate and empathetic towards one another and, and try and get back to some level of normal slowly. Other than the, the mean emails, how are you doing? How, how are you doing health-wise, and how are you doing in terms of worrying about your community? Oh, well, I, I survived the mean emails, okay? That's, <laughs> that's not a problem. I've got broad <laughs> shoulders, but, you know, I am at home uh, a lot. I've got two young kids at home, and, and my wife is working out of our bedroom upstairs while I work out of my office downstairs, and, you know, the kids need help with schoolwork, and uh, so very much like a typical family in that sure. regard. Uh, I think I just have a much higher volume of uh, emails and phone calls to deal with than normal. But, uh, you know, I love this job and I love this community and the people in it. So it's uh, still a pleasure every day to get to do it. Okay. Uh, Mayor Smith, thank you so much for making the time. I know a lot of people, this is on their minds, so I appreciate you giving that advice. And I would imagine it's similar advice across the country. Good of you to make the time, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Stay healthy. Thank you. That's Graydon Smith, the mayor of Bracebridge, Ontario, talking there about uh, what you should do as you move back and forth. Can you move back and forth between your, your primary residence in the city and a country home or a cottage home? And, and the best advice here in Ontario right now is don't do that. Uh, you shouldn't be going back and forth every weekend. It will put a strain on the system. And they are, of course, very worried in, in this province in particularly uh, about community spread. The public health officer yesterday saying that uh, he wasn't quite sure why there was so much community spread right now and they were trying to figure that out a little bit. About two minutes away from uh, seeing the Prime Minister today on this Saturday, in case you had lost track, uh, he will be coming out to uh, recap a little bit what his government did this week um, and the ongoing response and, and answer some questions too about the things Catherine and I were talking about, potential gaps and changes that might need to happen in some of the policy that has been uh, rolled out over the past number of weeks and past number of days. Because we're only a minute away, I'll bring back Catherine Cullen if I can, uh, knowing that I might cut her off. <laughs> sooner than I would like um, to get some, uh, to let the Prime Minister speak. Yeah, um, well, I, I, yeah go ahead, Catherine. You yeah. want to talk about a couple of the, the, maybe the major announcements this week, just quickly, sure. Rosemary. Um, one I want to mention is the essential workers announcement because we got a little bit more information from Alberta yesterday. We know all the provinces have bought in in terms of which workers they're looking at offering this top up to the premier saying that he thought that it would indeed be people uh, in the healthcare sector, long term care center workers across the country. Each province and territory is going to decide precisely who qualifies, who is an essential worker. But one stream of continuity that we're seeing here is 
I think everyone acknowledges that the people who are on the so-called front lines, the people who are putting themselves directly in harm's way, those are the people perhaps most deserving of this top-up. Then you see disparity from one province to the next. For instance, Quebec grocery store workers, if they uh, are making a relatively low income, they will be eligible for this. In, in Ontario, that's not the case. Another big mm -hmm, announcement mm -hmm. this week, and one that the government has been, uh, I think, pretty roundly criticized for. Earlier this week, the announcement of $252 million for the agricultural sector for farmers. We know that groups representing farmers wanted a lot more money than that $2.6 billion that they were looking for. The government has said that this week's announcement was really just a first piece to try to deal with some of the health and safety concerns to try to get farmers access to money that they might need to get through. Uh, but really a, a very widely panned announcement by many in the agricultural sector who were hoping for more help. Okay, Catherine, thank you. The Prime Minister is emerging there in his uh, Saturday outfit. Uh, let's listen to the Prime Minister of Canada now. Good morning, everyone. Ces jours these days, there are many Canadians out there who are going through difficult times because of COVID-19. The pandemic represents an unprecedented challenge for our country, and Canadians are suffering the consequences. But some individuals and some sectors are more hard hit than others. Therefore, this week, we announced additional measures to assist those who need it most. Now, first of all, we're reaching an agreement with all of the provinces and territories to top up the wages of essential workers. Those individuals are on the front line of the fight against COVID-19 and have been from the outset, and they're doing an amazing job. The best way of thanking them is to ensure that they are properly paid and protected. And this week, thanks to that agreement, we are now moving forward to a new step by putting more money in their pockets. We also announced more support to help uh, the food supply sector get through this crisis. We are giving more money to food processors to ensure the safety of their workers. We are also laying out special measures for pork and cattle producers so that they can adapt to market changes. And we are setting up a program that will allow the government to buy additional products that could be wasted in order to redistribute them to charities. And all in all, our government has proposed a, a, a lo loan capacity of $5 million and additional money to support food safety from the outset of this crisis. And as I said earlier this week, if we have to do more, we will do more. For the past few weeks, our government has been focused on getting people the help they need as quickly as possible. But to come out of this stronger than ever, we also have to think long term. We need to lay the groundwork now so our economy can come roaring back. And that's what we're doing with measures like the Canada Emergency Business Account and the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. So far, more than half a million business, small businesses have received a loan through the SIBA. And less than two weeks since launching the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, employers have applied for subsidies for almost two million workers. Our government is giving employers more resources so they can stay in business and keep people on the payroll during this crisis. Maintaining the connection between employer and employee will be key not just to help people get back on their feet, but also to our economy. In that vein, we announced yesterday that we would be extending the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy beyond June. At the same time, we're working with our partners from around the world to beat COVID-19 for good. This pandemic is a global issue. Keeping Canadians safe and restarting our economy means defeating the virus not just at home, but wherever it is found. So earlier this week, we announced new investments to accelerate the global development of COVID-19 vaccines, treatments, testing and research, including research being done here in Canada. 
Au cours des dernières semaines, In nous recent avons weeks, we established new assistance programs for workers and businesses, but we know that the work is not over yet. As the situation evolves, the needs and the challenges also evolve, and we are adjusting our response uh, consequently. We continue to be listening to Canadians, and we are always seeking other ways of supporting them. I want to close by asking all the moms to step out of the room for a minute so I can talk to your kids. I'll give you a second. Okay. Tomorrow is Mother's Day, kids. It's a special day for all the people who are mothers to us, our moms, stepmoms, grandmothers, aunts, and older sisters. So let's show them how much we love and care about them. You might want to get up early to make her breakfast or ask dad to help you get her some flowers. Or if you're not together this year because of the virus or other reasons, you can draw her a card or set up a video call. Whatever you do, I'm sure you'll choose, what you'll choose to do will make her day and express how much you love her, how much you need her, uh, and how much she has your full support and full love during this difficult time but all the time as well. Demain, c'est la fête des mères. Tomorrow is Mother's Day. It is an opportunity to show our mums just how much we love them. Maybe you'll get up earlier to make her breakfast in the morning, or perhaps you prefer to buy her flowers or prepare a card for her. Whatever you decide to do, I'm sure that you will really make her day by telling her how much you love her, that you'll be there for her, and that we will all be eat there for each other during this difficult time. Have fun and take advantage of this day. We will come through this together. Thank you, Prime Minister. We'll now go to the phones for questions. One question, one follow-up. Operator. Thank you. Merci. First question, Rod Nickel from Reuters. Line open. Prime Minister, as you know, the U.S. Department of Justice is looking into whether meat packers have unfairly profited from low livestock prices and high meat prices during the pandemic. And given that the same meat, big meat companies operate in Canada, uh, do you share that concern? Uh, we have significant concerns about the, the uh, entire scope of our agricultural supply chain. We need to make sure that workers are safe. We need to make sure uh, that that uh, Canadians from coast to coast to coast are uh, getting a reliable and safe su supply of uh, the food they need to feed their families and put on the table. Uh, and we also need to make sure uh, that no one is profita profiting uh, in an exaggerated way from uh, this crisis. Uh, we will take a, a very careful look to ensure uh, that people are there for each other and supporting each other, and no one is uh, focusing on profits before supporting Canadians. Well, well, Prime Minister, what, what, what will that careful look involve? Like, would you like to see the Competition Bureau in Canada look into this? We have many mechanisms uh, at the federal level to keep an eye on uh, supply chains and prices, and uh, we will engage with those, uh, those processes, as we have since the very beginning of this crisis. Okay. Uh, we know that it's very important to ensure that our food supply chain is, is secure and to make sure there's food for all Canadians. That means ensuring the safety of the workers who are on the production lines, but also ensuring that uh, those uh, supply chains continue to operate clearly and robustly for Canadians during this crisis. At the same time, we need to ensure that no one is placing profit before the health and safety of Canadians in the current situation. And we have uh, tools available at different levels of government, and we will need use them if necessary. Thank you. Merci. The next question, Theresa Wright, the Canadian Press. Line open. Good morning, Prime Minister. Um, we know from the National Inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls that Indigenous, Indigenous women were already more likely to experience violence, and now COVID-19 has exposed them to uh, concerningly high levels of domestic violence uh, due to the pandemic restrictions. Given this, can we expect to see the National Action Plan on the inquiry's findings in June as promised, or will COVID-19 delay this? 
No, the work that we're doing uh, on establishing a national action plan uh, on violence against women uh, coming out of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry uh, is more important than it has ever been. We have seen uh, in situations where someone is forced to stay home uh, when home isn't safe uh, a rise in domestic violence because of the stresses, because of the uh, confinements, because of the challenges we're facing because of COVID-19. And this government has worked uh, from the beginning to give more more support to shelters and organizations and networks that uh, are supporting uh, victims of uh, family violence or vi uh, gender-based violence. Uh, we will continue uh, to do that work. We will continue to work uh, very hard on that national action plan coming from the uh, missing and murdered inquiry. Uh, this is a priority that continues and is even intensified because of this crisis. Okay. Uh, Les situations uh, de, de violence domestique, uh, de violence, uh, domestic uh, violence and gender-based uh, violence uh, are unfortunately more prevalent during this crisis because of the stress and the confinement and the vulnerabilities of certain segments of the population. And that's why we are continuing our important work to counter uh, domestic violence and gender-based violence. We continue to work on the government's response to the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry, and we will continue to bolster those efforts during this crisis. We don't want to go backwards. On the contrary, we want to move forward on this. Thank you. Um, there are many people who are still not being uh, helped by your emergency financial assistance program. People who were unemployed before the crisis began, people on disability or social assistance, they're all left out. Will help be coming for them? We know that it's been important to get help out to uh, millions of Canadians very quickly, and that's what we've done. We've seen uh, over 7 million people uh, access the CERB, uh, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, uh, but we've always recognized there is more to do. Uh, we made modifications that ensure that people who uh, are recently unemployed, uh, whose unemployment benefits ran out before uh, COVID-19 started, would also qualify for, uh, for the CERB. We've put in place measures to support students. Uh, we've looked for other ways to fill gaps, and we will continue to. At the same time, we have given more money to community organizations and networks that are supporting our most vulnerable in cases where the direct support we're offering can't reach people. Uh, we will continue to work to make sure that all Canadians, but particularly vulnerable Canadians, uh, are supported through this crisis. Hi, Prime Minister. Chris Logue with Global News. With all of the aid money rolling out the door, are you simultaneously planning for how to help the economy back now or waiting until some of the pandemic is behind us? I think we obviously need to be thinking about the longer term while we design and while we bring in place support for people. That's why, for example, we move forward with the wage subsidy, uh, which, uh, unlike the CERB, is there for people who, uh, which is there for people who lose their job and lose their paycheck and therefore have uh, a uh, broken connection with their previous job. The wage subsidy allows people uh, to stay connected uh, with their employment so that once we start being able to reopen certain sectors and once the economy picks up again, people will still have that link by getting a paycheck uh, from that employer that will allow them to get back uh, positively and quickly. Uh, there are a broad range of ways in which the measures we've put forward are very much thinking about uh, the recovery. Uh, that goes part and parcel. But our focus right now is supporting Canadians so that they can do what needs to be done to slow and stop the spread of this pandemic uh, as we start looking at reopening. Sorry, but I'm not questioning the help. I'm asking if recovery plans are happening simultaneously. We are, of course, uh, looking towards the steps that will be required on, uh, on the recovery of the economy. Uh, that is uh, a significant amount of work that is ongoing. But our focus right now is on recognizing that we are not in the recovery phase yet. We are not even uh, fully into the restarting phase yet. We are still in the emergency phase where people need to get, get the support they need so they can continue to socially distance, to stay at home, even as certain regions and certain places are uh, talking about reopening. The vast majority of Canadians will need to continue to be very careful, and that's why they will continue to need support. Yeah. 
Nous savons que même si à certains endroits We know that in some places they are starting to restart uh, their society and economy, but we are still in a position where people must continue to protect themselves, must stay home, and continue to practice social distancing. As we slowly and gradually reopen the economy, we know that many people will have to continue to stay home, and that's why our emphasis right now continues to be on supporting families and workers so that they can do what we all need to do to stop the spread of COVID-19. Ashley Burke, CBC News. Uh, the government has suspended the shipment of 8 million N95 masks made in China that failed to meet specifications. How big a loss is that for Canada? And given that this was a Montreal company that had outsourced to China, does this not prove that we should not be relying on foreign outsourcing for such critical equipment? We have been working very, very hard since the very beginning uh, to bring in as much PPE as we possibly can. We've talked about uh, uh, almost uh, about 23 uh, different flights just from China of uh, uh, millions of items of PPE because we know the need is uh, and has been so pressing. At the same time, uh, we have ensured that uh, we are ramping up domestic capacity to be able to ensure uh, that we're, uh, we're covering the needs that we have uh, for the longer term. And I want to thank all the companies and manufacturers who've, who've stepped up. At the same time, uh, we also know that in the millions of items that we've received, uh, we have to ensure uh, that they are at the top quality expected by our Canadian healthcare workers. Uh, and the uh, withholding or the suspending of shipments from uh, this particular su supplier uh, is proof that our system works. We are testing all those masks, all those items, before they reach our healthcare workers because uh, we will not compromise on the safety and protection for our healthcare workers. From the very beginning, we have made every possible effort to have as much uh, personal protective equipment as possible. And that means that we uh, brought in 23 different flights from China. There are more flights coming in just about every day so that we have enough equipment for our frontline workers. We also know that we needed to develop our own domestic and uh, capacity here. And that's why many Canadian companies are now producing that equipment. And we hope to be able to rely on them in the months to come and at that point rely less on imports. But at the same time, we we know that there is always a risk that the products that we import do not meet Canadian specifications for our frontline workers. And that's why we have introduced a, a rigorous verification system so that no item that does not meet our specifications uh, here in Canada will be distributed. And the example of that Montreal company is the proof that the system is working because none of those masks uh, found their way into our health care system because we do the necessary checks. Prime Minister, a few weeks ago, one of your deputy ministers said that Canada was spending between a dollar fifty, or sorry, excuse me, a dollar twenty and six dollars per N95 mask. How much did we pay for these ones? Uh, right now, we're in discussions with the supplier because uh, we uh, will not uh, be uh, burdened with masks that do not fit our stringent requirements. There are discussions ongoing with them about uh, whether there are alternative uh, uses for these masks, uh, but we will not be uh, paying for uh, masks that do not uh, hit the standards that we expect uh, to give to our, uh, to our uh, frontline workers. We are currently looking at this with the supplier to see if there's any alternate use we could make of those masks. Perhaps so we could send them to other places other than to our health care system. But I can tell you that we will not play, pay the full price for masks that we will not be able to use within the health care system. The Commission reversed a rule uh, overnight that said people weren't allowed to take pictures in the parks of the tulips, and they installed signs to say no pictures, please. They are now taking those down. That follows Ottawa's reversal of a rule that you can't talk to your neighbours over fences and you can't visit your loved ones at the windows of nursing homes. Are we getting a bit overzealous with the COVID-19 rules? 
I think uh, different orders of government and organizations are trying as best they can uh, to put in rules that will balance the need to keep people safe and slow and stop the spread of COVID-19, while at the same time giving people the much-needed uh, respite uh, and safety valves from the stresses and indeed the, uh, the mental health challenges many people are facing. Uh, we need to try and uh, get people through this healthy, which means both uh, fighting COVID-19 and uh, supporting them and allowing for as normal lives as we can despite the deep abnormality of this situation. Um, it's an unprecedented situation. Lots of people are trying different things to keep people safe. Uh, we're going to keep adjusting, all of us, uh, when uh, we get things right, when we get things wrong. I think that's uh, what people expect. Good morning, uh, Mr. Trudeau, Radio-Canada. Some people may be taking things too seriously and some not seriously enough. Montreal uh, is uh, the hardest hit and public health officials are saying that if there's any relaxation of the rules, there will be even more people falling ill. Now, I know that you don't want to enter into a war with the provinces, but you have constituents in Montreal. So are you concerned? Are you, and do you think the Quebec government is doing what it should. Well, I am a Quebecer and uh, I'm a member of Parliament in Montreal and I'm very concerned about the citizens of Montreal just as I'm concerned about people right across this country. We have to base ourselves on science. We have to ensure that what we're doing considers the protection of all citizens and, as a priority, our seniors. So, yes, I know we have to talk about gradually and progressively reopening the economy, but that has to be done in such a way as to keep people safe. That's the priority. And uh, I'm monitoring what's happening in the seniors' homes uh, very carefully, particularly in my own uh, uh, riding, and I'm working very closely with other governments, including uh, François Legault's government, to ensure that we are taking the right decisions to keep people safe. Of course I'm worried, as a Quebecer, as a Montreal MP, uh, about the situation uh, going on in my riding in, in the province, as I am uh, concerned about Canadians from coast to coast to coast as Prime Minister. Uh, we need to make sure that we go uh, progressively and slowly and gradually on any reopening, keeping at top of mind uh, the importance of keeping people safe and healthy. I understand the economic pressures we're all under and I understand how much people do want to go outside. But we need to do it in ways that we are sure are going to keep people safe. Because the last thing people want is a few weeks from now being told, OK, we loosened the rules and now COVID spreading again and you're all going to have to go inside for the rest of the summer. People don't want to do that. That's why being very careful step by step is going to be so important. On a different topic, with respect to the labeling of uh, essential products, some pe products are coming in uh, with uh, not both uh, official languages on them. Did you find a solution to ensure that all those products coming into the country are labeled in both official languages? Well, first of all, we know that that uh, uh, labeling in both official languages is not just a matter of respecting uh, Canada's du uh, linguistic duality. It's also a question of safety for the users, for consumers and for customers. We have to make sure that people have access to those products and know how to use them properly. And that's why it was a concern for all of us when Health Canada Canada, and I know that this was shared by Santé Québec uh, that took uh, similar measures to allow for the labeling to appear only in English. Uh, but they, you know, there's been a, a search for other solutions because we want to make sure that the information is available online at the very least in both official languages and also in other languages if necessary for users. We all recognize that bilingual labeling is not just a question of recognizing the uh, uh, important bilingualism of our country. Uh, but it's a, ma a question of safety as well. It's a question of, of actually ensuring that people know how to safely use the product that they are, uh, uh, they are using or they are, are, are purchasing. Uh, 
that's why uh, I know that Health Canada and indeed uh, uh, Health Quebec uh, the, that approved uh, unilingual English labeling in certain limited cases didn't particularly want to and looked hard to try and find solutions. And I know on the Health Canada side, uh, we've uh, moved forward with online information that people can access uh, in multiple languages to make sure that they are going to be able to um, fully understand what it is that the products they're using. Ian Wood, CTV News. Prime Minister, you previ previously said that the economy and businesses should only reopen if they have uh, adequate PPE to protect workers. Uh, given the procurement issues, are you going to make any suggestions to the provinces that maybe they scale back on their reopening plans? And how long is the government going to be able to maintain these emergency subsidies? Uh, first of all, we agreed as all First Ministers, uh, Premiers of provinces and territories and the federal government, uh, that there are principles that need to underlie any restarting of the economy. And that's exactly what we're moving forward on carefully. Uh, that's why we're continuing to procure uh, massive amounts of PPE, uh, including flights almost daily for the rest of the month uh, from uh, China and elsewhere to ensure that we have enough equipment, even as uh, the Canadian producers <coughs> and manufacturers of these equipments are starting to come online and deliver their uh, uh, their products as well. We know that as we move forward to reopening, we need to make sure that workplaces are safe uh, for Canadians and that uh, we are arresting the spread of COVID-19 and preventing a second wave that could send us all back into confinement uh, this summer, which we certainly do not want to be doing. So uh, we're going to continue to work with the provinces to make sure uh, that they are able to fulfill the levels that they are projecting they will need in terms of PPE, and that is something we're going to continue. As for how long these, uh, this, uh, these supports are going to last, uh, we're going to keep adjusting to what the economy needs uh, needs are, but mostly what the needs of Canadians are to be supported and to stay safe through this situation. Okay. Uh, we have been working with the provinces and territories to establish the principles that will guide the reopening of the economy in a gradual manner and based on good vigilance. And at the same time, we need to have enough protective equipment to be able to protect workers and prevent the virus from spreading more. So we will continue to work on this and to bring in PPE. Uh, we will also be working with the provinces to respond to their needs by creating domestic production here in Canada. But we will be working with the provinces to ensure they have all the necessary equipment to be able to reopen their economies in a safe and secure manner. Now, with respect to the benefits for Canadians, we will look at the situation, continue to monitor things, and we will be there to support people and provide assistance to the country so that we can all stay safe. Thank you very much, everyone. All right, that is the Prime Minister of Canada on this Saturday giving us an update on his government's response to COVID-19 uh, and a message there for kids to celebrate their mothers in some way tomorrow. And I don't think that, I think that's because we're not expecting the Prime Minister uh, to emerge tomorrow because he's also uh, got a mother and a mother in his life and a wife uh, and three kids of his own. So um, I'll bring back Catherine Cullen uh, to uh, talk a little bit about what we heard there from the Prime Minister. I was mm -hmm. most interested, Catherine, in, in, in what he had to say about the masks yes. um, that were rejected, 8 million masks and 95 masks rejected after some testing by Health Canada. Yeah, and so let's start by giving the viewers a little bit of a sense of the context here. This was a uh, shipment of 11 million masks. We know that 8 million of them have been found not to be up to standard. These are those N95 masks that we've all learned so much about since the beginning of this outbreak. They're supposed to keep out 95% of particles or the ones that are used in the healthcare system. We know this was a Montreal-based producer who was getting these masks made overseas, I believe in China, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Problem with 8 million of the masks, a million of them work. Um, some 
of them still being tested as well. And the Prime Minister said a few interesting things there. Uh, while they have not named the producer and the initial reports about this raised questions about what was going to happen here in terms of what would happen to the masks, what would happen to the payment that the government was supposed to be giving for these masks, we heard the Prime Minister say very clearly there, we will not be burdened with masks that don't work. Perhaps there could be some alternate use outside of the health care field, but notably that they weren't going to pay for masks that were not up to standard. The question was specifically how much each of these masks cost. The Prime Minister didn't engage with that, but a bit of tough talk there without getting into real specifics, but essentially saying this, this is not okay, uh, we are going to push back. What I thought was particularly interesting, though, was the moment where he said, suspending is proof that our system works. And so people understand when these pieces of personal protective equipment come from overseas, there is checking that's done uh, by the Public Health Agency of Canada to make sure that they are indeed up to standard. This situation, the problem with these masks is not an isolated one. We have seen it around the world. Um, suspending is certainly proof that the, the, the check are being done and that these masks are not given to healthcare workers because mm -hmm. you can imagine that if they had gone into the healthcare system and they weren't up to snuff, the results could be devastating. Uh, but it is not a victory either, certainly, to see uh, 8 million masks no longer usable in the healthcare system. To put it into context, I believe the number of masks that Canada has received from overseas, according to uh, the Government of Canada, is somewhere in the neighbourhood of 33 million. And of course, there are efforts being made to ramp up domestic production. Everyone seems to agree that that is the key. Mm -hmm. Moving forward here, the new reality is going to involve a lot more masks and gloves, Rosemary, and so Canada is going to need to be making more and more right here at home. Yeah, and if you don't have a reliable source when you're outsourcing from a Montreal company, it sort of makes the argument indeed that, that the domestic supply chain has to uh, ramp up and in a pretty dramatic way. Catherine, thank you for this. We'll be back to you, of course, uh, as we wait for the noon briefing from public health officials and cabinet ministers. Thank you, Catherine. You're welcome. <laughs> Putting on a performance outside of one of Ontario's hardest hit long-term care homes. This is a local band, Trini Blue and the Distractions. The bass player, though, is the man who pulled this performance together. His 93-year-old mom is a resident of Eatonville Care Home. And we'll talk to him after the break about this show of support and what he's going to do tomorrow for Mother's Day. That's next on CBC News Network.
was a view outside Eatonville, one of Ontario's hardest hit long-term care homes by the pandemic. The residents there treated last week to this parking lot show by a local band called Trini Blue and the Distractions. The bass player is the man who put this performance together and his 93-year-old mom is a resident of Eatonville Care Home. She had COVID-19, but she has now recovered. So we wanted to speak to the man behind this lovely gesture as he gets ready to celebrate his mom, who you can see in pictures there. Michael Swantz joins me from Etobicoke outside of Toronto. Good to see you, Michael. Hi, Rosie. How are you doing? I'm good. So tell me first, how is your mom? Because she she was diagnosed with COVID. I know she's 93. How's she doing? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, a couple of days ago, I got a call and things didn't look really good because she was really weak. And then... Yesterday, I got another call, which was really interesting, and the wonderful nurse inside turns her iPad around, and I see this woman who I recognize as my mom sitting there <laughs> smiling and waving at me. I'm like, whoa, okay, what happened? I don't get this, but I do get it. Um, there's been a lot of people pulling for her. Um, yeah. If you want to use the word prayer and positive energy, there's people all over the place sending good energy to my mom. and. Uh, she seems to be doing really good at this point, so I'm as happy as can be. Well, that's great. What, what's your mom's name, Michael? Lillian. Lillian, Lillian May Swans. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. So this is also one of the long-term care centers that's been very hard hit, and the military is in there helping. What do you know about yes, what kind of additional help they are being able to provide for, for the center? Okay. Um, I did time in the military myself back in the 70s, mm -hmm. and I know that the guys that are in here right now are doing everything they possibly can to get this place spick and span and to the point where people can live in it comfortably. And everything that I see going on around here, uh, it, it's happening. I, I see the military folks walking in and out of this place in scrubs and in camouflage all the time. And I'm really, really happy about it, to tell you the honest truth. That's great. Michael, when was the last time that you saw your mom um, in person? Friday the 13th, March. Hmm. That's yeah. a long time. Fateful day, Friday yeah. the 13th, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it, you know what? We've, we've had some conversations on the phone, and we've done a couple of FaceTime conversations. And we're both pretty comfortable with the situation as it sits right now. So yeah. um, I don't feel too bad about the way things are. But you've done a lot to show your support from outside, whether it be the band, which was which was great. I see you've got a heart up behind you there. Um, has yeah, that, I, I put has, that up a couple of weeks ago. Has she has she responded to that? Does does she is she happy to see that show of support yeah. from outside? Yeah. Um, last week when we put this show on, um, with the blessings of Mayor Tory and the wonderful people at the TDSB and the people here at Eatonville, bless them and thank them for it. Um, we put it on and the nurses, they managed to get mom standing up by the window and I saw the recognition and she waved and music between mom and I is a very, very important thing. That's, that's how we started our lives together and um, it's always been something major for us. So being 93, I needless to say got a bit nervous and with the COVID thing hitting I got yeah. a little more nervous yeah. and I can't get in there and sit with her and I can't talk to her and I can't play my CDs or whatever for her and I figured the only way I could do this was to put this performance on A for her, uh, B for the people inside and very much so C for the frontline workers. These people inside this building are simply freaking amazing. They put their lives on the line on a daily basis, and we have to give as much as we can back to them. Simple well, as that. You, you, and you, if, you, yeah, I mean, you sound like a lovely, a lovely guy supporting them, and also a, a pretty good son too. What's it going to be like tomorrow when, <laughs> when you're not able to give her a hug and and hang out with her for Mother's Day? I gave her my hug last Saturday. Um, she she knows it. She feels it. She she uh, acknowledged it yesterday. Uh, not being able to be with her physically, it's going to be tough. But you know what? My mom's pretty tough, too. And I'm, I'm sure she's going to get through the day. I'm going to get through the day. Uh, likely, this is, there's going to be a lot of people out here all yeah. wind up watching and looking at their families and yeah. everybody waving. There was a family out here earlier. And uh, I got to tell you, along with myself, I got to take my hat off to uh, a lot of the people that show up here because 
Uh -huh. The weather hasn't been pleasant, and we've been putting up with a lot of stuff, but we do it because we love the folks inside, the well, ones that great. we care for, and, and for the ones that are actually taking yeah. care of the folks that we care for. Yeah. Yeah, that's, Michael, that, that's, Michael, that's great. I know that lots of people are, are living through this in, in the same way as you, and I'm sure you've inspired them for tomorrow. And happy Mother's Day, Lillian, if you're watching. Uh, Michael Swan, sure thank is. you so much from Etobicoke, Ontario. Thanks, Rosie. Bless take you. care of yourself. Take thank care. you. Okay, we're going to take a short break here on CBC News Network as we stand by for the federal briefing from cabinet ministers and public health officials. We'll be back in just a couple moments. Hello again, I'm Rosemary Barton here in Ottawa. Welcome on CBC News Network, live streaming around the world on the CBC News app and cbcnews.ca. We've already heard from the Prime Minister this morning. We're now standing by to hear from federal cabinet ministers and public health officials on their daily update on the pandemic response. Focus is now obviously turning to containment during this so-called new normal, living with COVID is the way Dr. Tam refers to it. Provinces are cautiously easing some lockdown restrictions for individuals and businesses 
businesses, very much dependent, of course, on where you live. There are still serious concerns in the two hardest hit parts of the country. That is, of course, Ontario, where uh, Ontario's top doctor says the latest data on new cases suggests that some people have maybe not been following rules on physical distancing strictly because there has been a fair amount of community spread. And Quebec, as you know, uh, had very ambitious plans to reopen stores and schools, particularly in the Montreal area, over some fears of another wave of infection. They have now delayed those plans, expecting to hear more about all of that in this briefing uh, shortly. I'll also tell you that on Saturdays, we generally get an update, too, from uh, the Minister of Indigenous Services, Mark Miller, about how this pandemic is affecting Canada's Indigenous communities. Uh, we do know that there's been an outbreak in northern Saskatchewan uh, as of late, even as the province there starts to reopen slowly as well. Uh, there does seem to be a, a, a difficult outbreak. I think 12 of the 13 new cases in that province uh, related to or have happened in Lalush, Saskatchewan. So uh, we'll hear more from from the minister about uh, the approach for you know, indigenous communities in, in, this, in this country as well. Let's bring in my colleague, the CBC's Catherine Cullen, as we wait for that briefing uh, to get underway, Catherine. Um, so as I was saying, we do usually get a bit of an update on uh, indigenous statistics um, mm -hmm. uh, at this Saturday briefing is where uh, Minister Miller appears. Um, but let me go back to the issue around uh, Montreal, yes. uh, because there was some startling information that came out uh, yesterday, and much of it has been published today, around modeling and, and what will happen on the island of Montreal if restrictions are eased in, in a real way. Uh, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite alarming, actually. Yes, it's a study from uh, the Institute of, Institute of Public Health in Quebec along with uh, Université Laval. And what it says is that if this deconfinement plan uh, is pursued, and right now Montreal, as you say, uh, while it's pushed back the date, it's looking at reopening elementary schools and some retail stores on May 25th. If this plan is pursued according to one of the models put forward by the Institute, uh, could be seeing as many as 150 deaths a day in the Montreal area by July, and that does not include, Rosemary, the deaths in long-term care centers. And we know across the country, and in Quebec in particular, that is accounted for the majority of the deaths. So it's certainly a very alarming uh, set of predictions that they have put out here. I think it is important to note that that particular prediction does not take into account the prospect of ramping up testing and contact tracing. We have heard officials in Quebec, um, not dissimilar in some ways to what we've been hearing here in Ontario, but officials in Quebec have been for days talking about the intent to ramp up uh, testing in particular in that province. In fact, it was supposed to have been ramped up to a new height by yesterday. Uh, seems like it is still a work in progress, but certainly that that would be one means of trying to manage this. But it does raise the question broadly of whether or not Quebec and Montreal should be pursuing this plan, if indeed that's the prognosis. We heard the Prime Minister being asked about that during his briefing. He is, of course, the MP for Papineau on the island of Montreal. He said, I'm concerned as an MP, I'm concerned as a Quebecer, uh, as a Canadian. But he did get quite impassioned when he talked about the prospect of reopening and then an outbreak and saying to everyone, listen, you've got to go back inside. Uh -huh. We've got uh -huh. to do this all again. He cautioned that people should be listening to scientists, to science. Um, was that perhaps a suggestion that this particular report, which is receiving a lot of attention, as you might imagine in Quebec today, uh, be taken seriously? I imagine so. But regardless of the Prime Minister's comments, you can be sure that the, the Premier and public health officials in Quebec are also going to be facing questions about this. Yeah, and I should say that uh, the, the Premier and, and the Chief Public Health Officer there, they have adjusted um, their, their reopening dates for Montreal. They had planned to reopen some retail stores and schools. They've now pushed that back by a week, uh, May 25th. But it's hard to see uh, how they even stay on that timeline, uh, given the way the outbreak is progressing not just in long-term care centers, as you, as you point out, for these projections, but also uh, in lower-income communities in Montreal. I know the, the mayor of Montreal has expressed some really serious concerns about the speed at which this is happening, and, mm -hmm. and the prime minister, obviously, um, in a difficult position politically to not uh, interfere with uh, what Quebec's decisions are, but also needs to send a message that, that 
this isn't going to work. Um, I mean, I think for now, Quebec seems to be responding when they see the data, but the fact that they put another uh, timeline on the reopening of Quebec seems to me uh, questionable, to say the least, for the Premier, and that's, that's pretty difficult for the federal government to navigate. Well, and, you know, in the beginning of this crisis, Quebec, the hardest hit province in Canada, we really saw in the beginning, uh, certainly the Premier Francois Legault, as well as Dr. Horatio Arruda, the chief public health officer there, really celebrated for the way that they yeah. were dealing with this crisis, despite the fact that the numbers were so bad. Part of the reason that Quebec has found itself in a particularly difficult situation, we should say, is that their spring break is earlier than in much of the rest of the country. So Quebecers were already returning from abroad, notably from the United States, and perhaps bringing COVID-19 back with them without realizing it, because much of, the can much of Canada, much of the world really hadn't woken up to just what we were in the midst of yet. Um, so Francois Legault, very popular. Quebecers liked what he was doing, you can see reflected now as some of these decisions are reconsidered. Um, there's been, a, I think, a lack of clarity around a range of issues and uh, the premier in particular finding himself more and more heavily criticized. Now, questions about everything um, from, in particular, there's been real questions about what happens to people who are in the age range of 60 to 69. Uh, the suggestion that even if they are teachers, they should be back in the classroom, they won't be at risk. If they're grandparents, maybe they could be taking care of their grandchildren, but maybe not. A lot of lack of clarity around issues like that, as well as these broader questions of timeline. So certainly a more challenging situation that is facing officials in Quebec right now. Also real questions about the interplay between what is happening in the hospital system and the hospital system's ability to respond to what's going yeah. on and the long-term care facilities, because a lot of um, people who were in long-term care facilities were transferred to hospitals, they recovered from COVID-19, but there was a fear about sending those people back into long-term care facilities. We've heard some really horrifying stories from both Quebec and Ontario when particular facilities get overcrowded. Um, there's one in St. Dorothée in particular where I know more than 80 people have died in one facility. Just some, some, some really uh, mm -hmm. troubling stories. And so there's a real effort underway to try to manage this. Um, but we should say, I think, a mix of, of public opinion as well. There, there is a real sense that uh, there are mental health issues at play. There are concerns about what's happening to children when they are left in the home and perhaps the most vulnerable children as well. And that is part of the impetus of trying to restart elementary schools and giving these children a safe place to be, the, the structure that they might need, the education that they might need. Um, but it, it just just leads to a lot of very difficult questions, I think. Certainly people across the country are feeling that, but perhaps mm -hmm. acutely in Quebec when parents are asked to consider whether or not they want to send their kids back to school, but knowing that um, they may be in a new class because there's only 15 students per class, that they have to keep a two meter distance from one another, that they're not going to be allowed to engage in things that you would normally imagine at school, recess, uh, you know, drama class, that mm -hmm, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a very different experience for children who are headed back to class, particularly outside of the Montreal area soon. Yeah, I, we, we should say that outside of Montreal, that was the, the point I wanted to make too, Catherine, it is quite a different picture in, in Quebec. This is really mm -hmm. uh, a virus that has hit uh, the island of Montreal in a very particular way. Uh, but even yesterday, I think Quebec had more than 900 new cases. Um, whereas in Nova Scotia, where they're in double digits of new cases, they have said we're not reopening school until next year. So obviously each province taking a different approach. But I think it uh, makes sense to ask questions about the speed at which Quebec is doing things, given the severity of the outbreak there. Catherine, I'll be back to you as uh, we hear from public health officials shortly. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and speaking of other provinces doing things differently, New Brunswick is moving ahead to the second phase of its recovery plan. Shana Luck joins us from Halifax with more details on the province's next step. Last time I checked, Shana, I think New Brunswick had two cases. Maybe they've gone away now or maybe you're up to more, but certainly that is what allows New Brunswick to move on to this next phase. Well, that's right, Rosemary. New Brunswick's certainly in a very fortunate position, and you can really tell uh, they are making the most of that. They're reopening things like restaurants, uh, shopping malls, art galleries, museums. Uh, those will all be allowed to reopen as soon as today. Um, only they have to respect those physical distancing measures. So they may not reopen right away, although they are allowed to, uh, but they will need some time to retrain their staff, maybe move things around within, uh, the, within the buildings, but uh, certainly they're in a very fortunate place with only 118 cases, no deaths in New Brunswick either. Okay, and so after this uh, phase, I think my briefing's about to start, so I'll just quickly ask you, Shana, after this phase, what's next? Are schools going to reopen? Do we have a sense of what will unfold next? 
Well, certainly for um, the, the rest of Atlantic Canada, uh, they are taking a very slow incremental process, uh, slow incremental steps. Uh, Nova Scotia, you mentioned not going, not bringing their schools back. PEI, though, is expanding their household bubbles. Newfoundland looking to move to their next phase on uh, as early as Monday. Okay, Shana Luck in Halifax today. Thank you, Shana. I appreciate it very much. Let me take you back here to Ottawa now, where federal ministers and public health officials are speaking. This is the Minister of Indigenous Services, Mark Miller, getting this briefing underway. Let's listen in. As well as myself. Without further ado, let's begin with the update in English by Dr. Tam, followed by Dr. New, providing the update in French. And finally, myself. Thank you. Merci and um, bonjour. Thank you and um, hello, everyone. The latest numbers on COVID-19 in Canada. There are now 66,730 confirmed cases, including 4,628 deaths. And 30,600 or 46 percent have now recovered. Labs across Canada have tested over 1,067,000 people for COVID-19 to date, with about 6% of these testing positive. In the past week, we've tested on average 26,000 people daily. Today, I want to focus on the disproportionate impacts and severe outcomes of COVID-19 on our seniors. It's hard to calculate the hardships endured and the grief that remains for those we've lost. Canada's older adults are the keepers of our history, culture and wisdom. Each loss is one too many, but the scale and impact on our seniors as a whole is nothing short of a national tragedy. Prevention and control of COVID-19 in high-risk populations is crucial for controlling this and future waves of COVID-19. These outbreaks drive up the case fatality rate, accelerate spread, and continue to spill over into the community. But it is our older adults who bear the brunt. Though an estimated 20% of COVID-19 cases in Canada are linked to long-term care homes, over 80% of all deaths are among seniors residing in these settings. A range of measures has been implemented in an effort to prevent the introduction and spread of COVID-19 in long-term care homes. However, many areas of the country are still struggling to get ahead of the rapid and stealthy spread of the virus in these outbreaks. We know that where there are weaknesses, whether structural, social or economic in nature, this virus will take advantage. If we are willing to give what it takes to address these weaknesses in long-term care and assisted living homes and to provide better support to poorly compensated workers in these settings, we stand a better chance of maintaining control of the virus. We will be living with COVID-19 for some time. If we make it a priority to look after the most vulnerable in our society, we can change the outcome of this pandemic and not live in its shadow. Together, we can do this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tam. Dr. New? Thank you. Hello. As usual, I will start with the latest numbers on COVID-19 in Canada. There are now 66,744 confirmed cases, including 4,628 deaths and 30,600 people, or 6%, now recovered. Labs across Canada have tested over 1,067,000 people for COVID-19 to date, with about 6% of these testing positive. In the past week, We've tested, on average, over 26,000 people daily. Today, I want to focus on the disproportionate impacts and severe outcomes of COVID-19 on our seniors. It's hard to calculate the hardships endured and the grief that remains for those that we've lost. Canada's older adults are the keepers of our history, culture and wisdom. Each loss is one too many, but the scale and impact on our seniors as a whole is nothing short of a national tragedy. 
Prevention and control of COVID-19 in high-risk populations is crucial for controlling this and future waves of COVID-19. These outbreaks drive up the case fatality rate, accelerate spread, and continue to spill over into the community. But it is our older adults who bear the brunt, though an estimated 20 percent of COVID-19 cases in Canada are linked to long-term care homes, over 80 percent of all deaths are among seniors residing in these settings. A range of measures has been implemented in an effort to prevent the introduction and spread of COVID-19 in long-term care homes. However, many areas of the country are still struggling to get ahead of the rapid and stealthy spread of the virus in these outbreaks. We know that where there are weaknesses, whether structural, social, or economic in nature, this virus will take advantage. If we are willing to give what it takes to address these weaknesses in long-term care and assisted living homes, and to provide better supports to poorly compensated workers in these settings, we stand a better chance of maintaining control of the virus. We will be living with COVID-19 for some time. If we make it a priority to look after the most vulnerable in our society, we can change the outcome of this pandemic and not live in its shadow. Together, we can do this. Thank you. Merci, Dr. New. Thank you, Dr. New. Good afternoon. Bonjour. Although nearly eight weeks have passed, the public health measures that we've been repeating from these seats and that you have heard so many times over have not lost their importance. They are just as important as on day one. As of May 8th, we've seen 165 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in First Nations communities on reserve and 16 cases in Nunavik in northern Quebec. I would ask everyone to remember that number as I continue with this update. This week, we saw a rise in cases within remote communities of northern Saskatchewan. We're concerned by this, and we are working with local leadership to support these communities in their response. Some communities heavily impacted around the Laloche area include First Nations Reserve, but not only. This is why we need to keep collaborating with the province of Saskatchewan to ensure the medical staff and leadership in the area can get the support they need to respond to this outbreak. The situation demonstrates that the onset of COVID in some Indigenous communities may have been being delayed by remoteness. We need to remain vigilant. And we need to do more to provide the resources to make sure that the people that are suffering from this in and around the Lalosh area and in Lalosh are properly served. This is what we've been working on. Across the country, we continue to work in close collaboration with Indigenous communities to, to secure the necessary resources to combat the spread of COVID-19, including with the Meadow Lake Tribal Council, the communities of Clearwater River Dene Nation and English River, Dene English River Nation, and the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan. For example, in northern Saskatchewan, all frontline health services are delivered by First Nations and tribal councils with public health oversight by Northern Intertribal Health Authority. Together, we are monitoring the inventories of personal protective equipment, or PPE, in this region. As of May 8th, we have sent 129 PPE shipments to First Nations communities in Saskatchewan, including 59 PPE shipments sent, direct, sent directly to the Northern Intertribal Health Agency. The Métis Nation of Saskatchewan, as well, has utilized resources through the Indigenous Community Support Fund to support their community members with a focus on elders, food security, and PPE. We're also providing direct nursing services to 19 Saskatchewan First Nations communities and are providing support such as nursing recruitment and health services coordination to 25 communities. Overall, there are 70 Indigenous Services Canada nurses in Saskatchewan offering services to all 74 First Nations communities in Saskatchewan. I'd like to sincerely thank them for tirelessly working, workingly on the front line of this outbreak and putting their own safety at risk. But numbers don't tell the whole story. First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities have done an incredible job in responding and preventing outbreaks. Their collective work in this is critical. 
and our commitment to support them and making sure they have what they need and are able to continue to protect their community members remains steadfast. Pour appuyer les leaders autochtones et nos partenaires à répondre efficacement à la to support Indigenous leaders and our partners to effectively respond to the pandemic and protect their populations, we have announced a support fund for Indigenous communities of $305 million in order to meet the immediate needs of First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities deal with COVID-19. Although most of these funds have already been directly transferred to communities, $15 million were also attributed for, uh, for indig urban and off-reserve Indigenous organizations. We also announced further measures in order to support the most vulnerable, help deal with this difficult period. So we have announced $10 million for the prevention of family violence shelters in, in, on reserves and in the Yukon in order to support women and children fleeing violence, $306.8 million in funding to help small and medium-sized Indigenous businesses and to support Indigenous financial institutions who are funding business, $75.2 million dollars for First Nations, Inuit and Métis students uh, at the post-secondary level to for the year 2020-2021, $129.9 million to respond to immediate needs when it comes to health, uh, economy and transportation in the North. We know that further help will be necessary and we are working actively to ensure that no Indigenous community is left behind. We are learning from past experience with responding to pandemics in Canada and specifically in First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities during H1N1, we need to recognize and understand that they have a higher risk of being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Along with better access to testing, we are acutely aware of the need to do better, more robust and routinely collected disaggregated data. As my colleague Minister Bennett says, you can't mend what you don't measure. And to be frank, the data that my department provides is limited by what it's being collected. This means accurate data is only available for First Nations living on reserve and for Inuit living in Inuit Nunangat. I ask people to remember the number that I gave at the outset. And if you look at the numbers in the far north in Lelosh, the number of positive cases is at about 170 plus. Of that, there are 16 uh, Indigenous, uh, there are 16 on reserve Indigenous positive cases. But given that Lelosh is a Metis, Dene uh, community of an overwhelming majority, the presumption then is that the entire 179 cases or so are Indigenous. And that's a gap in the data, frankly. When Indigenous leaders, and that, and I would add, I would take, a, I would pause to say, when you put that in an urban context, such as Montreal or Toronto or Vancouver or Calgary or Winnipeg, that data is just not there. When Indigenous leaders and organizations are calling for better data to be collected and disseminated to them, we need to make sure they have that data. It needs, to, it needs to include data for Inuit outside Inuit Nunangat, among citizens of the Métis Nation or First Nations people living off their reserves, and for this to be realized, we need help from provincial governments and public health agencies. This type of information is critical not only for Indigenous communities but for many vulnerable groups. We need to be able to put forward tailored measures to prevent any further outbreaks, as well as to expand and improve effective interventions if they occur. Indigenous-led analysis of this information is necessary to advancing culturally appropriate and science-based approaches, both with on and off reserve for First Nations and with Inuit and Métis communities. Indigenous Services Canada is playing a key role in collaboration with First Nations, Inuit and Métis partners, the Public Health Agency of Canada and the provinces and territories to support ongoing surveillance of COVID-19 positive cases for on-reserve communities. However, this data, as I mentioned, is not enough to provide us with an accurate overview of the impact of the virus in First Nations living off-reserve, as well as in Inuit and Métis communities. This is why I'm pleased today to speak to the work of Dr. Janet Smiley, a Métis research scientist and physician at the Centre of Urban Health Solutions at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. She's currently working along with many other partners to collect the necessary data that will allow for better understanding and modelling of COVID-19 cases in Indigenous populations in Canada. As part of the efforts and our efforts to support better distinctions-based data collection, we're providing $250,000 to this critical initiative to implement a COVID-19 tracking and response platforms for First Nations, Inuit and Métis. This project will include the de development of a COVID-19 consortium comprised of federal, provincial, territorial, First Nations, Inuit and Métis partners, and their data analysis will help inform the response to COVID-19 by Indigenous communities with the support from the federal government. 
In the short term, we hope that our work will help mitigate the adverse and disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 on First Nations, Inuit and Métis. They are leading the way in addressing that static gap, and I applaud them in this work and effort and look forward to the additional initiatives in this space. As I've highlighted before, um, on another topic, remote and fly-in First Nations communities are vulnerable during this time. The ongoing delivery of essential services, medical care foremost, and supplies to these communities in a time when travel is limited is particularly challenging, but critical to Canada's overall response to COVID-19. To minimize the risk and the exposure of the virus to community members and service providers alike, we are transporting essential service personnel and supplies via carefully managed flights that adhere to strict health safety measures on airlines that already serve these communities. The first flights of this nature took place on April 22nd. That day, 45 nursing professionals were flown to and from 23 First Nations communities in flying communities in Manitoba and Ontario. On April 27th, another 22 nursing professionals were flown to 13 First Nations communities and 18 left the communities on their return charter flights. These charters ensure that healthcare and infrastructure professionals, medical supplies and equipment required to maintain critical infrastructure such as water treatment plants will be able to access these communities. It also provides flexibility to support other community needs such as emergency management responses, food security or medevac services. In addition to maintaining critical services, this approach also provides a much needed revenue stream to airlines serving Indigenous communities, helping to support their economic long-term and short-term viability. As we face unprecedented times, nurses working in Indigenous communities continue to demonstrate their selfless dedication to ensure the highest quality of culturally appropriate care, testing and treatment. Once again, I want to thank the First Nations Inuit and Métis nurses practicing in various settings in Canada, caring for patients while working to promote and provide culturally safe health care. Although the numbers across Canada remain positive overall, I reiterate that we must all follow the public health directives and advice, such as maintaining physical distance, washing our hands, and avoiding large gatherings. These efforts continue to be crucial to slow the spread of COVID-19 within communities and between individuals. Our goal is to continue to work in partnership with First Nations, Inuit and Métis, and as provinces, territories and cities begin to discuss easing restrictions, we will continue to be extremely vigilant and defend the unique perspective and position in which Inuit, First Nations and Métis communities find themselves. I remain encouraged by measures taken by Indigenous leaders across the country, and I'm asking everyone to remain vigilant while we all work together so that everyone can be healthy and safe. Thank you. We will begin with questions now. Questions, one question, one follow-up, and we'll move on to the hall by the suite. Operator. Thank you. The first question is from Michel Lamarche from TVA Nouvelle. The première question de Michel Lamarche de TVA Nouvelle. Question from TVA Nouvelle. Go ahead. Hello. A first question for Dr. Tam, perhaps, and Dr. New. I'd like to hear your comments on the situation that is uh, persisting in long-term care homes. This morning you talked about a national tragedy, no less. Are you perplexed by the fact that it remains so problematic in many of these long-term care homes in which where, where authorities do not seem to have taken control of the situation whatsoever? Oui, merci pour la question. Answer, thank you for the question. This is Dr. New. It certainly is a national tragedy across the whole country, since we're seeing in all provinces and territories that there are outbreaks currently in long-term care health homes. It's also a problem in Quebec. We know that there are challenges, even structural challenges. Sometimes in institutions there are two, three, four people per room, and it's difficult to confine people who are ill and separate them from others who are not necessarily infected with the virus. But we know that health authorities on the ground 
are doing everything they can to test, identify, isolate, and treat people, perhaps sending patients to hospitals as required. I think this is a lesson for everyone to learn on, at, at all levels of government. And following this pandemic, perhaps we should have an inquiry to look at how we're treating our seniors, how we're supporting them. And I, in other language, I'm not sure how to say it, but how we can do better in supporting these residences and long-term care homes. And as Dr. Tam and I have said, even for the, the staff, too, because it's not just about residences, but all of these workers who are doing good work and doing their best under very difficult conditions. So we haven't found all the solutions and answers now yet, but uh, we're looking at what's going on now. And as we move through the situation, we are providing our best efforts. And I think maybe we are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Uh, what, what's happening in, our, in sort of long-term term care establishments across the country, uh, as Dr. Tam and I've said, uh, really is a national tragedy. Uh, uh, many of the issues or challenges in, in long-term care facilities, uh, I think, are evident. Uh, there's even structural ones in terms of, you know, sometimes there are two, three, four individuals in a room. It's difficult to uh, to separate a cohort, uh, sick people from uh, from the well people. Uh, uh, there's also challenges, as we all uh, appreciate, in terms of the personnel who are doing their best, uh, obviously working in these. Uh, in these uh, facilities that uh, uh, obviously, as we know, may have the, the, the supports they need, uh, as we talked about the pay, the fact they sometimes have to uh, work uh, between several uh, facilities. So there's lots that we need to learn from what's happening. Uh, certainly, I, uh, I think after all this, this is done, I think uh, even as our minister has said, that there needs to be, I think, a national conversation about how we treat our, our, our elders, how we uh, uh, house them, uh, take care of them uh, in, in their sort of in their uh, later years. Um, so that's something that needs to be done. But uh, certainly at the present time, everyone's doing their best. Uh, and I think we are starting to see a bit of, I guess, a light at the end of the tunnel. I would just say, as our minister has said, I think uh, we need a, a national conversation. Uh, what the forum is, it's not for me to say. I think it, uh, it's, a, it's a conversation at different levels, uh, uh, different levels of government. I think also different sectors. I think it's, it's a conversation beyond public health. I'm sticking to, as they say, the public health aspects. We certainly uh, uh, show from the epidemiology uh, that uh, uh, the older individuals, obviously those in, in long-term care facilities, are at a particular risk in terms of having, a, as they say, a more severe consequences, obviously including death, uh, if they do become infected uh, with uh, this virus, uh, but then uh, how that translates in terms of the conversations that uh, many other sectors and levels of government need to have to uh, uh, help manage and hope, hopefully uh, prevent and uh, not have this type of situation occur, should there be a, another second wave or even a future pandemic of another virus, yes, that, that, uh, that needs to happen. Thank you. Michel, on suivi. Follow-up question? Perhaps a second question for Minister Miller. Minister, I'd like to hear, as a Montreal MP, do you share the Prime Minister's concerns, which is what he said this morning, uh, facing, uh, look, looking at the outbreaks in all of these communities in Montreal, and uh, as Montreal considers reopening? Should we be risking the health and safety of the most vulnerable populations? Why not slow down the opening in the greater Montreal region? Merci, Michel. Answer. Thank you, Michel. Yes, absolutely. I am an MP for downtown Montreal. in which, of course, there are long-term health care homes. And the Army's been deployed. We have made superhuman efforts, huge efforts, and asked Montrealers to make huge efforts as well to stay at home. And so if we were, if we started loosening restrictions too soon, uh, it could endanger certain populations. I, my parents are in Montreal, in fact. My father will be 80 this year. He's a very vulnerable person. 
And my mother is 76. So this is, of course, personal, but it's also scientific. We can see what's going on in the seniors' residences. These are the most vulnerable populations. And they're there because they're vulnerable in the first place. And they want to live out the rest of their lives in dignity. And they're dying without dignity. We certainly have some long-term thinking to do after this pandemic is over. We are certainly not out of the woods yet. It's going to require a, a bit more effort from Canadians to ensure that we're not struck with a second and third wave. Those are my comments. Look, I'm, a, I'm an MP from downtown Montreal, uh, and uh, that is where, uh, along uh, with a number of other MPs uh, that are in our, our caucus and cabinet, uh, it, the pandemic is hitting and it is at its worst. Uh, the people that are dying are the vast majority, as Dr. Tam said, uh, very old. They have spent and been put into uh, long-term care facilities to pass uh, spend the rest of their days in dignity, and they're dying in indignity um, in vast numbers. And, and, and that, that will continue if there are um, measures that, uh, that, that are relaxed too soon. That is the scientific um, conclusion. Um, the Army is, is working as best it can. People that, um, you know, are willing to put their lives at risk, that's why they join the Armed Forces. And they are doing something that they are not used to doing, and they are doing it with exceptional professionalism, and we need to let them do their work. Uh, we need to let uh, the virus run its course uh, with all the measures that we put in place, and we've asked Canadians to do um, that they're not used to doing. And so to, 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 to relax measures uh, in a premature fashion would just raise another question about another wave that, or a third wave that would come hit us uh, harder than, uh, th than, than, than it should if, if we were to continue along um, the lines and according to all the sacrifices we've asked people to make and all the hit that it's had on the economy. So the issue is really to come out of here, come out of the come out stronger and strong um, and not uh, worrying about a second wave or additional shutdown measures. And um, we're asking people to do uh, and to be a little more patient. Uh, we're not out of the woods. And if you ask any of our top scientific minds, I think they would agree. Thank you, Minister. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Merci. La prochaine question de Theresa Wright de la Canadian Press. The next question from Theresa Wright from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Yes, good morning. Um, I have a question about masks. Uh, I'll pose it to Dr. Tam, but perhaps, uh, Mr. Miller, you could also weigh in as it has to do with pro procurement. Um, earlier this week, the, the Chinese embassy said uh, the 1 million N95 masks that were rejected by Canada last month were the result of a contractual issue. We still haven't been given a clear answer about what happened there. Now there are 8 million more masks that have been rejected. Can you give a clear answer about why Canada is rejecting these masks and whether we're still planning to purchase further supplies from these companies? It's Theresa Tam here. Uh, just uh, from the perspective of the agency, we um, conduct the testing, basically. So um, that's where we found that a significant proportion of um, these masks did not meet our standards. So, um, and just to say that none of them have um, been distributed for medical use. So that is sort of our key responsibility. And I know that um, um, the, the teams are working on the contracts, of course, uh, and the supplies are looking at this uh, very carefully. I don't personally know what the contractual issue is that uh, uh, someone has cited. Um, but um, I think, um, you know, our, our job is to, to make sure that whatever goes out, it meets a certain standard. And of course, when this much product does not meet standard, you have to go back and look at that arrangement. 
Well, I think that's right, Theresa. I think what you've seen publicly is uh, concerns over uh, a number of issues that, that, among other, Mr. Anand has mentioned, uh, which is, you know, in one case, whether the straps were adequate. Um, there's con perhaps concerns over the quality of the filtration, whether they, these masks can be repurposed. Uh, you know, when you're working in real time trying to uh, prevent the onset of a pandemic, you, you make decisions, uh, you make decisions quickly. And uh, the real challenge is to adjust in real time when you recognize that uh, that you may not have a, qual a source quality that works uh, and to move on. But as Dr. Tam said, um, we test we test vigorously. I think that's something people should be uh, glad for, frankly, as opposed to just deploying them into the public um, health system and, and, and encountering a lot of other headaches. So recognizing that um, they're, they're, it's very possible. And I'm not part of these discussions. I, I would direct those questions, frankly, to, to Minister and Ed, uh, so I don't know the contractual uh, uh, terms in, in between the parties, and, and I can't speak to that. Um, but recognizing that what uh, what Dr. Tam said is that we are testing and we are not deploying things that we believe are unsafe for the purposes that they were purchased for, uh, and that's an important conclusion. Theresa, follow up. Yes, thank you. Um, just on uh, some of the comments that you mentioned in your opening remarks, Minister Miller, uh, about a gap in data that's not allowing us to get a full picture of how COVID-19 is affecting Indigenous populations. Um, as you said in your remarks, this, a lot of this is because the data is held by provinces and territories. What measures can the federal government take to try to perhaps compel provinces and territories to provide this data? And how confident are you that they actually have the data are capturing this data as, as the pandemic has been spreading. Well, that's two separate and very important uh, considerations, Theresa. First, if the provinces and territories have the data, that, that's the easy part. Uh, and, and it's a question of really coordinating. And, and because we are moving at the rate um, that we are moving, it's, it's a question of gathering that and collating it and comparing it um, and having our top scientific minds um, work on it and, and draw conclusions for really two purposes. The first purpose is, um, as everyone knows, we've, 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 um, we've, we've, put forward some very um, rough approaches to trying to contain the pandemic, um, asking people to isolate, um, clamping down, um, asking people to quarantine. And that data is important across sectors and not, not, necess not just with respect to uh, Indigenous populations, but race-based data, ethno-cultural data that's being collected. Um, and it allows you, in the short term, uh, to to be able to take measures that are more targeted, um, whether you surround older old age homes, if, if you have age based data, uh, if you have um, certain communities that are vulnerable for whatever reasons, um, you can you can target your response as, um, as as you try to address a pandemic before you get the vaccine. And the second measure, and and and, and it is an equally important measure in the long term, is you can't do good public health policy without the data to underpin it. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, you need to have accurate data at the source. Um, you can tease this together and, and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of scientific modeling has a lot of projections and assumptions in it, um, but it is always based on a core set of assumptions based on important data collection. And so what we have is, uh, is across the jurisdictions, uh, all the provinces and the territories that when they test someone have a different sheet with a different set of pieces of information. Now, assuming that those sheets have uh, disaggregated data identifiers to begin with. We need people on the ground filling them out and then collecting them as they try to um, prevent people from getting infected. So there's a, it's a lot on, on, on frontline workers to ask them to do. But the importance that I'm trying to get out and we're trying to get out as a team is we need that data to be able to um, get real accurate information with respect to communities, get it out um, so that people know what um, what the measures can be taken to address uh, COVID-19 and, and how it's profiling and then give accurate models. Um, the other consideration, which is a very important consideration with respect to Indigenous communities, is Indigenous control over Indigenous data. Layered onto that is, 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 is a, is a sub-concern uh, dealing with uh, private patient confidentiality we have to respect um, the worst thing that could happen is to create an, another set of stigmas uh, that would that would be uh, that, that would that would fly around and, and people would judge people for no particular reason um, but that data is important to collect and we do have to be sensitive to first nations control over first nations data um, but the premise to that is that we have to be collecting it in the first place um, and while indigenous services canada for its part is able to tease out the amount of of, of people that are testing positive 
in communities uh, on reserve or in the far north um, when it comes to particular population which you know half the indigenous population of Canada is off reserve quote unquote mostly in the main urban centers and that really is the responsibility of the testing protocols of the province and that data is is either not collected or imperfect in its collection basis and that that's why we've teamed up with uh, w w with the folks at the University of Toronto at St. Michael's to to make sure that we have a center focal point with people that know what they're doing so that we can get a better sense of modeling but I I, I will hide from no one the fact that on the ground the testing and the the collection of that data right now is is, is far from perfect thank you minister operator next question please the next question the next question is from Althea Raj from Washington Post. The next la prochaine question is from Raj of Post. Hello. Um, I'm hoping you can hear me. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I'm, my question is for Dr. Tam and Dr. New. I guess I'm going to try this again from yesterday. Um, you said that we need to test more. Uh, yesterday you said that you're not hearing anything specific about the province and the territory is not having enough swabs or reagents. So what do we need to do to increase testing? So I think, as I said yesterday, there's a capacity, but we... As a public health community, the chief medical officers feel that you have to test for the right reasons at the right place. So just upping the numbers isn't necessarily the um, approach. But all of them, let's just say, are expanding their testing um, to include uh, people with a whole range of symptoms. That's one way of trying to widen your net to see if there's any further cases in the community, for example. You will see that many jurisdictions are now doing quite a lot of uh, system. Well, they're, they're essentially being very low threshold in testing high risk settings. So, if it's a long term care facility, if it's a correctional facility, if you've got an inkling that anyone is sick, test them. But also, if there's a case to rapidly enhance testing under all of those high risk conditions, is a good strategy. The other thing is that. It depends on the epidemiology. And so epidemiology is changing in Canada, and those numbers will go up and down as a result. Yesterday, you may have seen that in Quebec, in the area most affected, they are increasing the testing by mobilizing clinics to go into the hotspots. And that is how they are increasing their numbers. Um, and also, um, Ontario, for example, is doing a systematic uh, uh, testing of their long-term care facilities. So those are sort of in alignment with where uh, these outbreaks and cases are occurring, uh, but also to widen the net in the community setting. There's also been sort of surveillance approaches, um, and we will be examining more of these um, strategies as we move into the next phase with the chief medical officers of health, but also our uh, public health laboratory networks. So the guidance, for example, in the next phase um, is under discussion at the Special Advisory Committee as to where else would you need to test more. Um, but you can't just sort of, um, indiscriminately test areas where there are no cases and for which people have no symptoms. So otherwise, you again get into these issues of test interpretation. Uh, but it is an area that we're very seized with in, in how we do expand uh, into that. The other concept is surge capacity, because there may be other waves, and they may be waves into the future. We all got to sort of prepare for it by upping the capacity itself. If you expand a lot of tests, reagents, swabs, whatever, now in areas where there's probably not needed, you're then diminishing that capacity for when you actually need it. So, so this is a complex discussion where uh, we all agree that even with 60,000, you know, that's a good capacity, but we're not stopping increasing our supplies, resources, et cetera, to even beyond that, because you got to sort of prepare for uh, resurgences, et cetera. But, uh, uh, each jurisdiction may have their own reasons as to why they haven't. They, they've all set different targets, and uh, their uh, abilities and their um, you know reasons for not yet reaching those targets, for example, is diverse. I would say. 
It's, it's Dr. Yu, maybe I can just expand a little bit on what Dr. Tam has been saying. I think uh, it's, it's important to clarify when we've been talking about this sort of 60,000 tests, that speaks to, I think, from what I understand, the laboratory capacity, so the ability of, quote, the laboratories across the country to actually, quote, process the samples. But as we all know, there's, of course, a lot of steps in between in terms of actually, quote, getting the samples uh, from the patients who need to be tested and then getting to the laboratory so then they can do the analysis. So what we're seeing sometimes, uh, for example, that the case in the city of Montreal is that it's not just a question of having the laboratory capacity to analyze, but it's also having, quote, accessibility for the people who need to be tested to then, quote, get the samples taken as, as appropriate to then be sent to the laboratory. So in that regard, I certainly were seeing, for example, in the city of Montreal, good steps in terms of increasing accessibility with sort of mobile sites, et cetera, so that the patients, uh, it's actually closer and easier for the, for the people who need to be tested to get tested. So that's one of the things that we're seeing on the ground that they obviously is, is, is getting better and better. Thank you. We'll see you follow-up. Okay. We're getting yeah closer to the answer I was looking for yesterday. But So I appreciate that you're explaining to us what we need to do to uh, expand uh, capacity in terms of, like, who we should be testing. But, you know, when you talk about accessibility, can you outline those reasons? Dr. Tam, you said there are many reasons. Like, practically speaking, how could the provinces be testing more? What needs to be done to increase testing practically? So I think that depends on the jurisdiction themselves. So um, uh, a lot of the um, provinces that have had no cases, they've had no transmission, they're in a very different situation than some of the larger provinces uh, who do have cases and are still dealing with some community transmission. So it depends on where... Uh, you're talking about. It, it does have to be tailored to the individual setting. Some areas might actually have human resource issues. You need actual people to go out to test cases. So um, making sure you have the necessary um, trained people who can do the testing is one. Dr. News talked about accessibility, maybe uh, making those um, you know testing clinics closer to where people are. We talked about um, the deployment of um, certain more closer to patient tests, like point of care testing, to the more remote uh, communities. That's another area where we can, um, you know, increase capacity as well, um, so that people don't have that sort of turnaround time. Um, the in, in Saskatchewan, for example, that was a good um, sort of example of how. They are now systematically looking at those communities where there have been cases in the north. And that involved the deployment, uh, which they have now access to, um, some of the sort of point of care testing uh, capacity. And so there are a number of these, um, I, I guess, challenges that each jurisdiction has to undergo from, as Dr. New said, the moment that the patient needs to be tested all the way down to uh, transportation and, um, you know, laboratory um, testing capabilities. And a lot of the strategies are designed to tackle each one of these components. Uh, but it might quite well be different in downtown Montreal to downtown Toronto to Saskatchewan. Thank you, doctor. We'll now turn to the room, starting with Christian Noel de Radio-Canada. Question from Radio Canada. I have a question for Minister Miller and for Dr. Tam as well. Mr. Miller, you said about Montreal, we're not out of the woods. Perhaps we're going too quickly. Could you specify what your concerns are for people and also what it means for the future if we're moving too quickly? And for Dr. New and Do Drs. New and Dr. Tam, do you share that concern? and that of the Quebec uh, National Institution of Public Health, is saying that, which stated that if we opened up too quickly and eased restrictions too quickly, it would lead to further deaths and illness. Answer. I am, firstly, I'm afraid of uh, more people dying, and secondly, I'm afraid of uh, further outbreaks. Follow-up answer. Yes, this is Dr. New. Thank you. We are continuing our discussions. We're in good communications with our Quebec counterparts. And certainly in Montreal, the situation is more serious than the rest of Quebec. It's quite complex. In fact, if 
Currently, we have a very difficult situation in long-term care homes, but it's also related to what's going on in the Montreal hospitals because before, perhaps when seniors were quite ill, they were transferred for compassionate care in hospitals, but what's now going on in institutions with the outbreaks is that it's not a good idea to transfer them uh, or transfer them back to uh, the long-term care homes. So they are sent to hospital. They're in beds with uh, not much flexibility and not much wiggle room in the hospital's capacity, especially if we're expecting a second and third wave, potentially. So we need to closely look at the Montreal system and situation and do a lot of testing and tracing because if we start lifting public health restrictions, we have to be ready to adjust the, uh, as we go, go along, as the situation evolves. I'm not there on the ground, but I can see what the other uh, Quebec public health authorities are doing. So maybe there's a schedule for all of Quebec, but it may be a bit different for Montreal, for stores and shops, for example, because the situation is different in Montreal compared to the rest of the province. So, uh, uh, yeah, the situation in Montreal, it, it's, uh, it's uh, obviously, uh, uh, everyone recognizes it's serious, and, and it's, it is complex, uh, for example, uh, uh, because of the situation that uh, we know is a, is a, is a, is a a problem in in the, in the long term care facilities. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, several weeks ago, obviously there were there were patients there, residents who were who were who were sick, ill, and then were transferred to hospitals in Montreal. But now with the sort of the ongoing situation in those facilities, uh, it's not uh, appropriate to be quote transferring these patients back. And therefore, obviously they're taking up beds in the hospitals. In the hospitals in Montreal, there's not a law, a law large we say a. Uh, uh, excess capacity, or, 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 or sorry, you call it, a, you know, um, surge capacity in case there might be a, a, a second wave or, or, or sort of a, um, um, another uptick in cases. So that's why the authorities in Montreal are watching the situation carefully. It's a, it's for sure uh, important that you need to have a very a good surveillance system, testing system. So should as the uh, measures of this say uh, uh, sort of a, a slight relaxation of the public health measures are taking place, and maybe there might be opening of schools. Or, or, or businesses, that you have to be ready uh, to be able to detect rapidly, uh, deal with the situation, and then maybe adjust as, as it goes along. And, and this one is for uh, Dr. Tam and maybe Dr. Nu as well, but Dr. Tam, I'd like to hear you first on this. Uh, if Quebec is one of the hardest, his, hard, hardest his hit area, Montreal as well, and they seem to be proceeding maybe early, maybe quicker than other area. Uh, cases seems to be still increasing. Testing is not up to par. Do you feel Montreal and Quebec is following the federal guidelines right now for deconfining, and what would you suggest they do? Well, I think uh, from all the chief medical officers, we laid down the sort of criteria for um, relaxing, if you like, the public health measures, which includes the, the testing the ability to do case and contact tracing, isolation, quarantine, etc., and making sure there's capacity. So all this is being evaluated by the jurisdiction every day. Um, they may or may not change the, the, the target date uh, according to the situation, and I think that's what they're trying to do every day. Um, and so there, there has to be flexibility um, and that, um, you know, I, I think that is very clear to our um, uh, colleagues that you have to, the Montreal area is different to other areas of Quebec. And they're being cautious. So some of these measures are done outside of that area. They've moved these mobile clinics in to certain hotspots to get some more testing. So they are going to try to be very, very careful about this. And they have to evaluate this probably on a daily basis in terms of what's going to happen. Pardon? No, no, on n'a pas dit ça, c'est Dr. New, je pense que. This is Dr. New? No, we didn't say that. I think that the Quebec health authorities, and not just of Quebec, but in Montreal too, 
are analyzing the situation as we go through it. And there's also a special advisory committee, which is looking at all measures, even preventive measures at the individual level, washing one's hands often, maintaining social distancing, physical distancing of two meters minimum. These are all important measures and remain so. I think in Montreal, in public transportation, they, we have strongly recommended that people wear non-medical masks if they are going to use public transportation. So I see that uh, and, and the Montreal health authorities have done that. They are taking our recommendations seriously uh, while adapting them to their own context in Montreal. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ashley Burke, CBC News. Dr. New talked about having a national conversation around long-term care after this is all said and done because it is a national tragedy. Um, uh, Minister Miller and Dr. Tam, do you think that's a good idea? Should there be a public inquiry into long-term care homes after this? Look, Ashley, I, th I think as I'd mentioned earlier, uh, what we're seeing is that really the older segments of the population, those in long-term care facilities, are being, uh, by a vast uh, proportion, uh, heavily impacted by this. It's a question, as a human being, I think everyone is asking uh, ourselves uh, how we treat, um, in some cases, our grandparents and um, our, our elder segments of the population, um, That what form that takes. Without any question, I think everyone's going to be asking themselves that. I, I think there needs to be some serious look into into the way um, into way that that is done on an institutional basis. Um, it's probably premature to to speculate as to what uh, what form that lesson takes. Um, I think that is probably. Uh, the smaller consideration to the bigger reflection we all need to have as to how we finance, resource, help um, those people that are the most vulnerable. In this case, uh, the, perhaps the greatest generation that uh, that that, that um, are the reason why we live in a free and democratic country. Uh, it, it is. It is it is it is scary to see people fall like that. And when you talk about indigenous communities in particular, you're seeing some people that are last carriers of their language, and you can see entire languages disappear. So um, those are particular vulnerabilities that I see in my in my files. I think Tom sees them as well, and and that risk is top of mind when we look at indigenous communities. When we look at Canada writ large, uh, we need to be asking ourselves those serious questions. Um, and there needs to be serious discussions around financing, around funds, around support, around um, around even how we ourselves treat some um, our our, our own grandparents. Um, they're, you know, some of the stories coming out of those, out of those long-term care facilities. You see um, people that um, are looking for refugee status that are helping out. Um, you see, um, you see first-generation Canadians. Um, you see people that are uh, th that are uh, working for low-paying jobs. That's another reflection I think we all need to have. Um, but that needs to be institutionalized in a form, and I think that is secondary to the greater consideration, which is how we treat our, um, how we treat our elders. Dr. Tang, if you want to add. Yeah, and um, again, I'm not going to speculate the format at which that takes place, but it is really critical that, you know, it, in out of all the uh, impacts of this pandemic, we've got to learn something in a huge way about how we treat as individuals, society, communities, governments, um, on our um, older adults, and in particular, those who reside in uh, long-term care homes and uh, assisted living. But there may be other areas where seniors reside as well that needs to be improved. So I think it's a big societal um, a conversation. It's probably not a single one. It's going to be many different ones uh, coming together because so many people are involved. Um, so absolutely, it, we've got to do better as a nation. Yeah, and Dr. News, to be clear for the record, I'm not personally asking, as you say, for a public inquiry. I, I basically reflected what our minister, health minister, Minister Haidu, has said previously about the need after this is all over the half Cody national conversation. So exactly as Minister Miller and Dr. Tam have said, the nature and form is to be determined. But I think we can all agree in terms of uh, we need to take care of what needs to be done now. And then afterwards, I think upon reflection, there's different ways we can have that type of conversation in different ways and, and do better. Thank you. Okay. Um, Answer repeated in French. 
As I said, I think that's what's currently happening with our seniors is a tragedy in our long-term care homes. As Minister Haidu already stated, we're going to have to have a national conversation across the country at all levels of government and across all sectors to see how we can do better. Uh, and just about mass, um, uh, Dr. Tam, I'm hoping to, to find out what you're hearing from your chief med from rental car officers of health across the country about the supply of N95 masks, especially at long-term care homes, and if this um, shipment, this most recent one of 8 million masks that was rejected because they weren't up to that quality, what impact might have that had, and on particular in long-term care homes? Um, I actually don't have the details on specific in, uh, impacts on long-term care homes. Uh, we do have, um, you know, daily um, um, linkages with all provinces and territories as to what the requirements are. And I do know that there's, there's a sort of distribution framework that is at play, but I'm sure that any shipment that has to be rejected will have some pressure on the health system in terms of its N95 uh, capacity. Um, and um, so, but I do know that um, all the requests for assistance that we've received, uh, I think over 40, the majority of them have either been met or are in the process of being met. Uh, I don't know the, the exact numbers. Um, I'm actually um, very um, heartened to see some of the domestic um, um, supplies being one of the innovations in this space as well. I think um, um, some of them are going to be where we are looking at. But yes, I mean, every day, this is one of the biggest, um, I, th I think, challenges that we feel every single day. Every, all the supplies have uh, uh, sort of being the, sort of utilized and then stuff coming out is a big sort of uh, process in ensuring that uh, jurisdictions have what they need. But um, so far, as far as I know, um, all the requests for assistance that we received were have been met. Thank you, Dr. Ian. Ian Wood, CTV News. Um, Dr. Tam, uh, some pictures from Vancouver this week show packed beaches full of people again. Um, uh, that province has moved forward with some very gun ho uh, uh, openings. Um, yet now in South Korea, a country that's been uh, recognized as having this more under control or getting it under control, is putting restrictions back into place and locking uh, certain businesses down. Um, do you foresee us having to do that as well? Um, I think. As you know, the Chief Medical Officer of British Columbia and everywhere else in Canada are, are being very cautious. Now, the public, having contributed greatly to our efforts, um, must be reminded that we're not going to back, be back to completely normal to the pre-January um, of this year, and that if there are gatherings of that nature, um, of course, it's up to us to constantly remind people that that is not uh, the public health advice. We, I think, we, the the advice is to go outdoors, but you can't be. You got to observe social distancing measures. So, uh, it is going to be difficult, I think, because people have heard these messages for a very long time. But we still got to sort of ensure that these habits that may have been instilled continues. So that is still going to be a key part of the response. If there were any uptick in cases that may, the loosened public health measures may have to be sort of rein, reinstated. We do not want that to actually happen. So I think everybody continues to have to listen to their um, provincial or local public health officers because this is serious. The virus has not disappeared from the face of the earth. It's still circulating in some parts of Canada. So it is something that is going to have to be a sort of ongoing behavioral shift, which is not an easy thing to do. And Canadians now are still allowed to travel between cities, between provinces. How is that going to affect reopening? If one area reopens certain businesses, 
sectors, uh, recreational facilities, and another dozen, but people can still travel freely. Is domestic travel not a risk to those areas that are reopening? So this is why you need the national linkages, because you have to share information to know where cases are. But that is, is true, that if there are um, outbreaks in certain areas, uh, other parts of Canada is going to be uh, looking at whether there's any travel-related cases so um, and reevaluate that. Um, and so I think uh, that is absolutely something that we have to watch for in the next phase. In terms of domestic transportation, Transport Canada, for example, has instituted certain measures, including the wearing of masks. Some jurisdictions still have... Um, measures in place for anyone traveling outside of the uh, provincial jurisdiction. So they have um, particular provinces that haven't seen cases or haven't seen uh, transmission, but also if they have a, a smaller health care system or service, they're going to be protecting those areas, including domestic people coming from other parts of Canada. Uh, through domestic travel. Uh, so a number of jurisdictions still have that in place, given their own epidemiologic situation. But that will, again, have to be reviewed uh, as in the coming weeks and months. Thank you, Dr. Ceci may faire la conférence de presse. Merci. This brings this press conference to a close. Thank you. Okay. That is the end of the uh, federal briefing on uh, the pandemic in this country. Actually, a, a fair bit of information there uh, today from uh, public health officials and from Minister Miller. Uh, I, I will say that there were uh, really almost pleas from Minister Miller and uh, Dr. Theresa Tam around the ongoing uh, tragedy happening in Canada's long-term care centres. Just to give you a statistic that, that struck me, uh, and we'll bring in Catherine Cullen as well uh, to talk about this, Dr. Tam uh, made the point that um, 20 percent of overall cases in this country have happened in long-term care centers, but those cases account for now more than 80 percent of the deaths uh, in long-term care centers, which is just a, a, such a, a staggering number. And I, I've said it before, but um, obviously it's going to have to lead to some kind of change because that that can't continue now or any time in the future. Um, lots yeah. of lots of. Yeah, go ahead, Catherine. Yeah. Well, I would say, and those statistics, Rosemary, I think really do speak to the heart-wrenching vulnerability of the people who live in long-term care homes, they, who are there in the first place because they need this support, uh, but because they are so very much in need of that help because their health is potentially fragile. They are particularly susceptible to the virus. And, you know, even at the beginning of that, when Dr. Tam um, was talking about the statistics for the long-term care facilities, and we've been hearing earlier from the Prime Minister, we heard from the Deputy Prime Minister yesterday about Mother's Day, and it's very mm -hmm. cute messages uh, about, you know, making mom breakfast, cleaning the room. I, you just can't help but think of all of the people who are not going to have their mother tomorrow to celebrate Mother's Day, and that we are thinking of them as well. Uh, in terms of the reflection, and the form that that is going to take about what to do about long-term care facilities. Very interesting moment there where Dr. Howard New said in French uh, that perhaps a public inquiry could be needed, but then uh, when pressed on it in English suggested, well, it needs to be a national conversation and no one was willing to advance themselves on precisely what that national conversation should look like. We heard Minister Miller say that speculating on precisely what form that would take is premature right now. But as you say, the words from Dr. Tam in particular um, talking about the fact that there needs to be a huge reflection about what we can do to better support people, uh, talk about not only the money, but also the circumstances that people physically find themselves in. When Dr. New first raised this issue, he talked about two, three, four people to a room. Mm -hmm. How do you separate them? How do you protect them? The workers as well, uh, whether or not they're being adequately paid, may find themselves needing to work in numerous facilities. Obviously, this is a situation uh, we want to resolve because of the current outbreak, but something that needs attention well beyond this. Everyone agrees. The question is, what does it look like and when does it happen? There was also some uh, questions about the situation in Montreal, which has become a, a real outlier in terms of the uh, severity of, of uh, the pandemic. And uh, again, Minister Miller, who is an MP for downtown Montreal, said mm -hmm. uh, that we cannot move, but we cannot move forward too quickly. The science is showing us that that shouldn't happen. So uh, that again, something that 
keep our eyes on. But before I let you go, I, I do also just want to talk about the, the Indigenous uh, data gap that uh, Minister Miller talked about very frankly there, uh, because it is, uh, while there are 165 uh, reported cases on reserve, that does not, uh, Minister Miller, uh, very, very honest about the fact that that does not paint an accurate portrait of uh, what Indigenous peoples in this country are experiencing. Yeah, quite a few issues today that really require some very uh, sober reflection. I mean, he talked about, he said, I'm not going to hide the fact that the data collection is far from perfect. And he also pointed to some of the challenges in trying to collect better data. I thought it was interesting to hear him talk about the importance of Indigenous controlled Indigenous data, the concerns about further stigmatizing uh, people and the work that needs to be done. But of course, uh, and this is something we're seeing certainly beyond Indigenous communities, but is perhaps particularly uh, of concern given their vulnerability and a variety of other issues, but uh, a broader collection, a discussion rather about uh, race-based data and how that can feed into best understanding what is happening with this outbreak and thus best addressing it. Uh, you know, he talked about new efforts that are going to be made to better collect that data, but also that there are challenges. He acknowledged the challenges frontline workers are already facing and asking them to do more, but also spoke about the importance of having this information in order to be able to address this situation properly. Yeah, and just to give people a sense, that outbreak in northern Saskatchewan that I was talking about, that they're watching very, very closely. Uh, there are 16 on reserve cases of COVID-19, but Minister Miller saying there's 170 in the community of Lalash, and given the number of Métis and Dene and other groups uh, in that community, it's likely that most of those cases are also uh, Indigenous. So the number that they have, 165, is, is, is in no way accurate, and, and he certainly doesn't think that either. All right, Catherine Cullen, thank you very much for You're all welcome. your help uh, through our coverage today. Appreciate it very much. And thanks to all of you as well for watching both the Prime Minister and the Federal Briefing. Uh, they are taking a day off tomorrow, so so will I. Michael Serapio continues our coverage on CBC News Network right now. Take care.